We are finally ready to define the titular topic of lecture 32, that of a BCH code. So let's give that definition here. So let's C be a polynomial cyclic code over Zn, right? We're, we think of a cyclic code, these are gonna come from ideals of the group ring Z2n. We do call it a polynomial code because we're thinking of our code words as polynomials inside of this group ring here. And suppose that D is equal to the number 2r plus one for some, for some number r here, right? Uh, so we're gonna think of D is gonna be our minimal distance of the code and why does r matter here right well we've seen previously that if your if your distance is d if your d equals 2r plus 1 that means you can correct um r many r many errors so that that's the significance here that if, if d equals 2r plus 1 you have r level of correction of errors inside your code okay so we say that c is a bch code of length n and distance d where n of course is the size of this cyclic group um, that's going to tell you how many entries are in each code so do you have a 5-bit message a 15-bit message etc that comes down from the length there that's the n and then the distance is again the minimum distance there um, we've seen previously that cyclic codes are uniquely determined by a single minimal generating polynomial which gives you the generate it's the it's the generator of the principal ideal that is the code um, call that element g of x our generator polynomial then we say that the code is bch the cyclic code is bch if the generator um, g of x is the minimal polynomial uh, of the uh, i should say it's the least common multiple of the polynomials m1x times m2x um, times m3x all the way up to m2x for which for the sake of this definition mix is the minimal polynomial of zeta i where zeta is a primitive nth root of unity over z2 so these polynomials mi of x are in fact cyclic tonic polynomials um, so we could call this like phi of of such a thing but of course over finite fields, primitive nth roots actually can split from each other. And so there actually could be two cyclic tonic polynomials of degree five or degree 15 or something like that. Um, and so we'll just use mi here to, to help us keep track of these things. So mi is the minimal polynomial of zeta i, where zeta was a primitive nth root of unity over z2. And this is why we say it's the least common multiple, because as we've seen, um, the minimal polynomial for right here, so m1 of x, this is the minimal polynomial of zeta, okay? Well, this polynomial likely has other roots to it, like maybe it has zeta squared or zeta to the fourth. That means m2 would be the same as m1, m4 would be the same thing as m1. So this list will likely have repeats inside of it. We don't want to take the product of all these things. We just want to find the least common multiple. All right. And that's then when we can we get G. We call that a BCH code. Why BCH? Where does the what is the what does the acronym come from? Well, this comes from the mathematicians that first established this coding scheme. Uh, so in 1960, uh, the mathematicians RC Boss and um, DV Ray, I'm going to write it out first, uh, Chad Hurry, uh, developed what we now know as a BCH code. And in 1959, um, working independently, uh, the mathematician A. Um, Hawkinson, whoops, that's a Q, Hawkinson, and I do apologize if those names were not pronounced correctly, um, developed this idea. Now, Hakuin actually developed it a little bit earlier, but in the realm of publishing, it can sometimes take a couple years to get a, a mathematical or scientific article peer-reviewed and published. And so these, these two groups worked independently of each other uh, and happened around the same time period. So we give credit to both. Um, so while Hakuin actually did beat um, the other two in this development by a year. That's somewhat of an irrelevant detail. It's very possible they could have submitted this paper first. I mean, I, I, we could probably look it up if we really cared. Uh, but nonetheless, credit is given to all three of these mathematicians. And in proper mathematical tradition, um, when giving uh, accreditation, uh, 
I should say attribution to mathematicians. Uh, typically the names are listed in alphabetical order. Uh, there's not like this ranking of like who's the top, who's the first author, the second author, because when it comes to mathematical contributions, um, even a potentially small contribution, if it completes a proof, is just as valuable as any other ones. And so the mathematical community, we try to consider all authors equal and therefore name, names are listed in alphabetical order. So hence we have BCH right here uh, as the name of this type of code. All right. Uh, there, of course, are some deviations to that, like the RSA uh, encryption particle, uh, protocol is not in alphabetical order. It should be ARS, but whatever. It's just it's just been established at that point. But for this one, we got it right, BCH. Um, it's going to be the product of all of these cyclic tonic polynomials. Okay. And so an important result when it comes to uh, BCH code is the following equivalencies. So suppose that we have a cyclic code over Zn, then the following three statements are equivalent to each other. C is a BCH code of distance D. So that is the same thing as saying that every polynomial f of t inside of our code C, uh, it, it, that is, it's a, it's a code word, it's a code polynomial f of t, if and only if, um, zeta i is a root of f where i ranges from 1 to d, uh, 1 included inside of that. And thirdly, this is equivalent to um, h, which is the parity check matrix associated to c here, is the associated Vandermonde matrix where your first column is all ones, your second columns are powers of zeta, then zeta, uh, then you square everything, then you cube everything all the way up to z to the n power at the end like there. So we have this Vandermonde matrix. Uh, these, these three things are all one and the same thing. All right, uh, for which, why is that? I'm not gonna go through all the details of this proof right now. Um, I mostly wanna focus this video on an actual construction of a BCH code. Uh, so I will leave the details to the viewer here, but I will give you the basic idea of what's going on here. So from the definition we just saw a moment ago, right? Um, you have a BCH code if and only if G is the least common multiple of these cyclic tonic polynomials. That's the definition of being a BCH code, okay? And the fact that you are your minimum distance is at least D, where D is this number right here, 2R plus 1, that means we have our polynomials from um, 1 up to M1 up to M2R. So that guarantees a certain inclusion of cyclic tonic polynomials. So if you have a BCH code, that means M1X is a divisor of g, which means that when you take a when you take g of x, g of zeta um, is in fact a root. Okay. We also have that since m two is a polynomial a divisor of g, z zeta squared is a root. Um, m three is going to be a divisor of g, so that means zeta three, and this is going to go up to uh, two r, which two r is one less than d. So we have all of the roots of g are going to range, well, at least there could be more, but we have roots where zeta 1 through zeta d minus 1 are all roots of g of x here. Now, every every code, every cyclic code is determined by a principal ideal uh, with a unique generator g. So f belongs to the code if and only if f, uh, I should say g of t here divides f of t, okay? Um, but since G has all of those roots, F will have all of those roots as well. Um, and since G, of course, is the least common multiple of this thing, if F has all of those roots, that means that G divides F and that F belongs to this. So that we get that A implies B very, very quickly. And you could also reverse the direction, I think, pretty, pretty quickly as well, that if we have this assumption in particular, this is a property of G, and G then would have to have all of those roots. So G would be the least common multiple of all of these things. Um, and yeah, so we get we get A and B are actually quite to each other pretty quickly. Um, when it comes to this Vandermonde matrix right here, um, be aware that Vandermonde a matrix multiplication is the same thing as polynomial evaluation um, for which when you look at this thing right here, if we took the coefficients of our polynomial f and we put them in here, so like the first we have a0, a1, all the way up to a n minus 1. So if we take the coefficient vector associated to the polynomial, then multiplication by the Vandermonde matrix will give you the evaluation of the polynomial. So you end up with f of zeta right here. Then you get f of zeta squared all the way down to f of zeta to the 2r 
which of course is d minus one like so. And so if this, if, a, if this is a parity check matrix, then this product should be zero, which means each of these things is equal to zero, for which then all of these are roots for all of the polynomials inside the code. So that gives you that C implies B. And you can also reverse the direction as well. Since this thing happens, um, this product is equal to zero. So that there, and this, since this happens for every code in the code word, uh, this gives us that this is a parity check matrix. So again, I, I didn't provide all the details of this thing, but very naturally we can see that these three things are all equivalent to each other. All right. And so we can create linear codes in our usual manner using uh, parity check matrix H and then a generator matrix G. Um, this is not the canonical parity check matrix, but nonetheless, we can use this random on matrix using primitive roots of unity. Um, to produce a BCH code if we wanted to, all right? Uh, for the most part, we're gonna probably stick with the polynomials. And so in, in this video, I want to give us an example of a BCH code. Um, we're gonna construct a BCH code over Z2 using the 15th, the 15 roots of the 15th roots of unity, okay? So in order to do that, we have to first establish what is the factorization of X to the 15 minus one as a polynomial in Z2X, because we have to know what, what the cyclic tonic polynomials are, and that does depend on the field. All right, so let's look at Z2X and factor X to the 15 minus one. I claim that the um, prime factorization is on the screen right now. Um, so we have X plus one times X squared plus X plus one times X to the fourth plus X cubed plus X squared plus X plus one times X to the fourth plus X plus one times X to the fourth plus X cubed plus one. Okay, uh, so one can verify that the product of these uh, five polynomials does in fact simplify to be x to the 15 minus one when you work mod two. Um, you can pause the video and check that right now if you want to. Um, I'm actually gonna try to work it backwards and show you where this factorization came from, okay? Uh, because when we look at this list, I claim that um, if you take the polynomial x to the four plus x plus one, the roots of this polynomial are primitive 15th roots of unity. The roots of this polynomial are, are likewise primitive 15th roots of unity, 15th roots of unity, but I'm gonna focus on this one. And so I'm gonna take a random root of this polynomial, I'm gonna call it zeta, and that's gonna be a primitive 15th root of unity, and that's gonna be my starting point. Therefore, I claim that M1 of X is gonna be this polynomial X to the fourth plus X plus one. And so in order to prove that the roots of this is, uh, the roots of this polynomial are primitive 15th roots of unity, then that's actually gonna give us the factorization. Because if this is in fact a divisor of this, which we can check easy enough that it's a divisor, even if you don't wanna do all, the, the, all of this extended foil on the screen right now, you can at least do polynomial division, take X to the 15th minus one and divide it by X to the fourth plus X plus one. You can verify this is a divisor. And as such, the roots of this polynomial have to be 15, 15th roots of unity, but why are they primitive? Okay, well, one of the obvious ones is that if you take the polynomial M0 of X, this equals to X plus one, what's M0 here? M0 would be the minimum polynomial of zeta to the zero, which of course is just one. So we need the primitive first root of unity, um, which is gonna be X plus one. Clearly, if you plug in one, one plus one is zero mod two. So one is a root of that thing. It's a linear polynomial, it's the only root. So this does give us M0 right here. All right, so that's the first one to take care of. Now look at the polynomial x cubed minus one. By the usual difference of cubes formula, even over the rational numbers, this is gonna factor over as x minus one times x squared plus x plus one. But as we're working mod two, this polynomial x minus one is the same thing as x plus one. And so the roots of the polynomial x cubed minus one, um, which again, when you're working mod two, it could be x cubed plus one, but that's beside the point. The roots of this polynomial are gonna be third roots of unity. Um, this is the first root the first root of unity. Um, so then the other two third roots of unity, because there should be three total, um, are gonna be the roots of this polynomial, which this polynomial is in fact irreducible. You can check very quickly that zero and one are not roots. So this is gonna be um, our third roots of unity and this is our first roots of unity. Now be aware here that if you take, and this is gonna have both third roots of unity. The third roots of unity are actually gonna be things of the form zeta to the fifth, uh, because notice if you take zeta to the fifth cubed, you're gonna get zeta to the 15th, which is equal to one. So the third roots of unity actually are gonna be uh, zeta to the fifth and zeta to the 10th. So in particular, x squared plus x plus one, this polynomial is going to be M5 in our classification. Okay, now we can also factor, we can also factor x to the fifth minus one 
in the following way. You can take the difference of fifth powers there, for which you're going to get x minus 1, and then x to the fourth plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus 1, like so. Again, this translates into x plus 1 when you're working uh, mod 2. So this is, the this, this is the first cyclic tonic polynomial, which then, as there are five fifth roots of unity, four, four primitive ones, right? Um, they have to all be right here. And you can check, again, this polynomial is irreducible. Uh, why is it irreducible? Well, zero doesn't work. Um, one doesn't work. And so it doesn't have a root. It could factor as a product of irreducible quadratics, but as we discussed previously, there's only one irreducible quadratic over z2, and that is x squared plus x plus 1. So if it factored, it would have to factor as x squared plus x plus 1 here, squared. For which, as we're working mod 2, we can use freshman exponentiation. This becomes x to the fourth plus x squared plus 1, which is not the same thing as this polynomial. It's also not the same thing as these two polynomials as well. So uh, for similar reasons, these uh, these degree 4 polynomials are irreducible. 0 and 1 are not roots, and this factorization is invalid for them. Um, so all four of these degree 4 polynomials are, in fact, irreducible. And so they would have to be then the fifth... Uh, this has to be the, the, the... This would have to be the fifth cyclic tonic polynomial uh, because this polynomial, um, it contains... It, its roots have to be fifth roots of unity mod 2, um, and there's four primitive ones, and that this is degree four minimal polynomial. It's got to be that case. Now, be aware that if I take zeta cubed and I raise that to the fifth power, this gives you uh, zeta to the 15th, whoops, 15, uh, which is equal to one. So, the in fact, the, the, fifth, the fifth roots of unity are going to look like zeta cubed, zeta to the sixth, zeta to the ninth, and zeta to the twelfth like so. And so this polynomial right here is my M3. Okay? So this is the cyclic this is the cyclotomic polynomial, minimum polynomial for uh for the root zeta cubed. All right? So then by process of elimination, we've taken care of we've taken care of the first, third, and fifth roots of unity. So we're left with eight uh eight 15th roots of unity. So the roots of these two polynomials have to be the 15th roots of unity. All right. Um, and so as such, if we choose one arbitrarily, um, I'll say one of the roots of this polynomial is zeta. That makes this M1. Um, and then what about this one right here? It's going to have some other roots. But how are the eight, how are the eight uh, primitive roots distributed? Right? You have a zeta. We have a zeta squared. We have a zeta to the fourth. We have a, let's see, uh, we, have, we did five. We did six. Uh, so then we have a zeta seven. We have a zeta eight. We have a zeta, 9 was already taken care of, 10 was already taken care of, so then 11 comes next. We did 12, so there's a 13, and then there's a 14, all right? So here are eight um, primitive 15th roots of unity, mod 2. Um, so how, how do we distribute these eight roots amongst these two polynomials, all right? Because at this point, um, you... If you, if you took x to the 15 minus 1, you factor out these things right here. Um, we then get this polynomial. We get some degree 8 polynomial. We potentially could factor it here. All right. Uh, but let me give you another way of how this thing is going to work out. Uh, so notice, let's see, by, by a limit we proved previously, if you have a polynomial um, which has zeta as a root, then as we're working mod 2, zeta squared is also a root of that polynomial. Now, as zeta does not belong to z2, um, this is a different element. Uh, we, so we get zeta, zeta squared, but then zeta squared squared, because 2 is the characteristic of our, of our field right here. You're also going to get zeta to the 4th as a root, and then you square that, you get zeta to the 8th as a root, and then you cycle that back, um, zeta to the 16th, since these are 15th roots of unity, is going to give you back zeta. All right, so this tells us that, in fact, the four roots of our polynomial, uh, so M1, which is equal to x to the fourth plus x plus one. This has to factor as x minus zeta times x minus zeta squared, x minus zeta to the fourth times x minus zeta to the eighth. And this is the factorization, of course, over the splitting field F16 uh, for, for these polynomials here. Uh, this then tells us that the other polynomial, x to the four plus x cubed plus one, um, it has to have as, as, as its four roots, Zeta to the 7, Zeta to the 11, Zeta to the 13, and Zeta to the 14. 
So we, so in particular, this polynomial is M7. I'm, I'm just going to write the smallest one in there. Uh, so this is the cyclic tonic polynomial for zeta to the seventh, like so. All right, so that's how we get these factorizations here. So now we know what the roots of each of these polynomials are supposed to be. Um, so this one just has its root one. This one had zeta five and zeta 10. This one had zeta six, uh, excuse me, zeta three, zeta six, zeta nine, zeta 12. This one had zeta, uh, zeta squared, zeta fourth, zeta eight. And this one had the other ones, zeta seven, zeta 11, zeta 13 and zeta 14. So we know exactly where all the roots belong in this polynomial here. So this is, gives us our factorization of x to the 15 minus one as a polynomial over z2. All right, so in summary, um, x plus one is m0, um, x squared plus x plus one is m5, x to the fourth through x to the zero is just gonna be m3, x to the fourth plus x plus one is m1, and x to the fourth plus x cubed plus x1 is m7. Now, admittedly, you could swap the roles of these two polynomials. It wouldn't make much of a difference whatsoever, uh, but but what have you. Well, we, we chose this one right here as our m1. So now, if we want to create a BCH code of length 15, that is where it comes to the factorizations of x to the 15th minus 1 mod 2, um, if we want that to be distance 5, okay? Distance 5 means that we need to look, we need to construct our polynomial g of x to be the LCM of, we're going to take m1, we're going to take m2, we're going to take m3, and we're going to take m4. That is, we stop one short of our d5 right here. So 5 minus 1 is 4, so we're going to take the least common multiple of these, of these four polynomials. But notice here that m1, which is this one, um, it has zeta 1 as a root. It also had zeta 2 as a root. It also has zeta 4 as a root. It also had zeta 8 as a root, but I don't really care about 8. So this one actually takes care of all of these. So these three are actually all the same polynomial. Um, okay, so we get, we get M1. What about M3? M3 was this one right here. It, had as, it has zeta 3 as a root. Of course, it also has zeta 6, zeta 9, zeta 12 as a root as well. So the for the BCH code of distance 5, we have to look at the product of M1 and M3, which is going to give us 1 plus x plus x to the 4th plus 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the 4th. And when you multiply those out, again, working mod 2, this will simplify to be 1 plus x to the 4th plus x to the 6th plus x to the 7th plus x to the 8th, like so. And so then this G generates a BCH code, uh, a 15-7 block code, right? So our messages have, our encoded messages have length 15, uh, but then we can encode uh, seven bit messages using, uh, using these things right here. Now remember, how did we end up doing that? Well, G of X is a degree eight polynomial and you get 15 minus eight is equal to seven. So we can encode uh, seven bit messages by multiplying it, multiplying it by um, G of X right here. We've seen this previously. So this gives us a 15, seven BCH code. Um, it's minimum distance is gonna be at least five. It could be better than that, but it's at least five, all right? Uh, and so this tells us that, well, five can break down as two times two plus one. So this code is going to give us two error correction. And so I want to bring to the memory of my students that on a take home test uh, back in the prequel math 4220, uh, you were asked to create a linear code, um, a linear code whose uh, error correction was in fact two, right? And it was a hard question at the time. We were able to work through it. The BCH code gives us a much simpler way of doing it, um, less guessing, checking, more methodical because it comes down to factorizations of cyclic tonic polynomials. Now, with g of x, we can also compute h of x because uh, it should be the property that g of x uh, times h of x is equal, to, sorry, that's the wrong way. I mean, for the polynomials, it doesn't make much of a difference for the matrix, it does, so I want to be consistent there. So h of x times g of x should equal zero, um, where of course zero in this ring is the same thing as x to the 15 minus one. So we can just take x to the 15 minus one and divide it by g, right? So g was m1 times m3, so we grab the other three factors, m0 times m5 times m7, 
which is a reminder where these three polynomials. Skipping all the details here, you can multiply those out, and this will simplify to be the polynomial 1 plus x to the 4th plus x to the 6th plus x to the 7th. This, this polynomial then gives you the parity check uh, matrix. Um, we, we can just use a polynomial, of course, because if you have any code... Um, if, like if you if you receive the message f of x right here, then you can multiply by h, and this should then equal zero if it's a code word. If it's not a code word, you're going to get something else. Your syndrome will be non-zero, and you know an error was uh, an error was detected. We can ask for retransmission. Um, we're going to, of course, end lecture 32 here. We haven't yet talked about how um, one can error correct with a BCH code. We know that it can, at least this code, can detect at least two, correct two errors. Detection's much easier because you just have to look at the syndrome. Um, if the syndrome's not zero, you've detected an error. But how do you correct them? That takes a little bit more, and I'm actually gonna leave that as a exercise to the viewer. In particular, we're gonna see this on a, we're gonna see this on a future take home exam, at least for my students, that's what we're gonna see. But that brings us to the end of this conversation about BCH codes, how we can use our finite fields to develop theory for more sophisticated linear codes than we did with just group theory alone. Um, so thanks for watching. In our next videos, we're gonna to return to general field theory, particularly we're gonna to go to Galois theory and define finally what the Galois group of a field extension is. So uh, if you've learned anything about BCH codes or polynomial codes or cyclic codes in these videos, please like these videos, subscribe to the channel to learn more about these in the future or to see more videos about Galois theory or what have you. Um, and please post any comments below if you have any. I'll be glad to answer them as soon as I can. Bye, everyone.